1. The Old Man Who Lost His Horse Once upon a time, there was an old man named Sai, living on the northern border of China. He was really good at raising horses. One day, Sai's horse ran away to the neighboring Hu country. When the neighbors heard about it, they came to offer their sympathy. But Sai just smiled and said, Losing my horse might actually turn out to be a good thing. A few months later, the missing horse returned, bringing with it a fine horse from Hu. The neighbors came over to congratulate him, but Sai frowned and said, Getting this fine horse might not be such good luck after all. Sai's son liked to ride the fine horse, but one day he fell off, breaking his leg and becoming disabled. The neighbors came to express their condolences, but Sai calmly said, My son breaking his leg might not necessarily be bad luck. At that point, the neighbors thought the old man was too grief-stricken and had lost his mind. A year later, the Hu nation sent troops to invade. All the able-bodied young men were drafted, and most of them were killed. Since Sai's son had a broken leg, he stayed home and avoided death. Only then did the neighbors realize that Sai's words were truly profound. Commentary It goes to show that a blessing in disguise can sometimes be a curse in disguise, and life's outcomes are hard to predict. Of course, Sai's story is a unique and rare case, but the moral is life's fortunes and misfortunes are unpredictable, so stay calm and reflect. What seems like a loss might not be a total loss, so don't lose heart or give up. Sometimes it's from our losses or misfortunes that we might find luck. On the flip side, don't get too happy about immediate good fortune. It might bring trouble. This is also a lesson about patience in life. Blessings within misfortunes. Misfortunes within blessings. Say losing his horse. Knowing misfortune can turn into fortune. Misfortune is the root of fortune, and fortune is the root of misfortune. They alternate and generate each other. This transformation is unseen. Only its consequences are visible. Thus, the proverb, Sai losing his horse, who knows what's a misfortune or a fortune, was created, meaning that it's hard to tell when a situation will turn around. So, when fortunate, don't be overly joyous and forget caution for potential misfortunes. And when facing misfortunes, don't be too distressed, harming your spirit. Life's fortunes and misfortunes come and go, so like Sai, maintain composure through the ups and downs of life. The saying also goes, Misfortune is where fortune rests. Fortune is where misfortune hides. Life's fortunes and misfortunes come and go, so emulate Sai and maintain calmness through life's fluctuations. We can never truly predict what lies ahead. Life isn't always as we expect. 2. Spider's Prank A monkey was invited to his fiancée's house to hang out, and he happily asked his friend, the spider from the West, to come along. The monkey loved to look flashy, so before heading out, he put on a pair of big, bright, fake eyes. The spider from the West was always the jealous type. Seeing how fancy the monkey looked made him green with envy. He decided to seize every chance to mess with the monkey. The monkey's fiancé was thrilled to have two special guests over and quickly went to cook some rice. At that time, the monkey was sitting by the fire. Taking advantage of a moment when no one was paying attention, the spider sneakily threw a green chili pepper into the fire. Suddenly, everyone started coughing and sneezing, tears streaming down their faces. Since the monkey had just put on his fake eyes, they started to hurt him badly. He rubbed his eyes and the fake eyes fell out. The monkey's fiancé, seeing this, got really mad. She accused the monkey of being deceitful and lying, and she tore up their marriage contract. When the monkey found out it was all the spider's doing, he was furious and stomped the spider flat. This story reminds us, never be friends with those who are always jealous and hate on others. 3. 
The Old Woman and the Wine Jar An old woman found an empty wine jar that had once been filled with fine aged wine and still carried the sweet aroma of the wine. She longed for it, putting her nose close to the jar to smell it over and over again. She tilted the jar up and then down, saying, Oh, how delicious it must have been. Even after it's gone, the jar still holds a wonderful fragrance. A good deed is remembered forever. Kindness never fades away. 4. The Fish and the Ducks A fish flopped onto the shore, and when the water receded, it got stranded in a dry puddle. Thinking it was about to die, it was fortunate to see a group of ducks passing by. The fish then pleaded, Please, can I have some water? Otherwise, I'll die. The group of ducks replied, Just lie there and wait. We're going to find some food and we'll bring back water for you to swim in the afternoon. After saying this, the ducks flew off to the fields. The fish lay waiting all day under the scorching sun. By the evening, the ducks brought back a puddle full of water, but by then, the fish had already dried up and died. 5. The Story of Two Horses There were two horses, a mare that did no work at all and just wandered aimlessly in the field, and a stallion that was only let out to eat at night and had to plow the fields during the day. Seeing this, the mare said to the stallion, Why do you bother pulling the plow? If I were you, I wouldn't put up with it. If the owner tried to whip me, I'd kick back. The next day, taking the mare's advice, the stallion became stubborn. The farmer, seeing the stallion's rebellious behavior, decided to make the mare do the plowing instead. Encouraging others to misbehave ultimately harms oneself. 6. The ants return the favor. In a certain forest, a group of ants fell into a puddle of water. Nearby, on a tree branch, a little bird just out of its nest saw this and felt sorry for them. The bird quickly picked up some twigs and dropped them into the water to make a bridge for the ants to cross. As time went by, the bird didn't remember the ants anymore. This small bird liked to build its nest on the branches of the wild cherry tree because the branches were full of sharp thorns. The wild cherry used these thorns as a defense against enemies, and thus, it also protected the bird's nest. Cats and big crows found it hard to navigate through the sharp thorns to get close to the bird's nest. But one day, a gray wildcat, ignoring the thorns, tried to sneak up to the bird's nest. Suddenly, a large group of ants appeared and spread out all over the wild cherry branch where the bird's nest was. The wildcat was scared off immediately because it remembered the painful sting of an ant getting into its ear before. The group of ants that had fallen into the puddle that day did not forget the bird's kind act of building a bridge to save them from the water. 7. One afternoon in the park, a little boy wanted to meet God. Knowing it was a long trip to where God lived, he packed his bag with Twinkie cakes and six boxes of juice, then set off on his journey. After walking three blocks, he encountered an old woman sitting in the park, quietly watching a group of pigeons. The boy sat down next to her and opened his bag. He was about to drink a juice box, but noticed the old lady looked hungry, so he offered her a Twinkie. She accepted it with a smile so warm that the boy wanted to see it again so he offered her a juice box. She smiled at him again. The boy was overjoyed. They spent the afternoon sitting together, eating and smiling without exchanging words. As it got dark, the boy realized he was tired and got up to leave. After a few steps, he ran back and gave the old woman a hug. She gave him the biggest smile he had ever seen. Entering his house, his mother was surprised by his joyful face and asked, What made you so happy today? He replied, I had lunch with God, Mom, and you know what? She has the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the old woman returned home with a radiant joy on her face. Her son was surprised by the happiness glowing from her and asked, Mom, what made you so happy today? She joyfully said, 
I ate Twinkies in the park with God. And you know what? He's much younger than I expected. 8. The Deer and the Fox One day, a deer encountered its old enemy, a fox caught in a trap, struggling in the forest. Approaching cautiously, the deer raised its hoof in anger and struck hard at the fox's head. Seeing the hoof coming, the fox swiftly dodged, avoiding the blow. As a result, the deer's hoof hit the trap instead, freeing the fox's paw. As the fox made its escape from the trap, it looked back at the deer and said, Having a foolish enemy like you is almost as good as having a good friend. Making a little difference. I was taking a stroll on the beach as the sun was setting. Despite the crowd, my attention was drawn to a young boy who kept bending down to pick something up and throwing it into the sea. As I got closer, I realized the boy was picking up starfish that had washed ashore and was tossing each one back into the ocean. I was puzzled and approached the boy, asking, Hi there, I'm curious about what you're doing. I'm sending these starfish back to the ocean. You see, the tide is going out and all these starfish have been washed ashore. If I don't throw them back into the sea, they'll die here due to lack of oxygen. I understand, but there are thousands of starfish on this beach. You can't possibly save all of them. And this is happening on hundreds of beaches along the coast. Do you realize that you can't really make a significant difference? The boy smiled, bent down to pick up another starfish, and as he threw it back into the sea, he replied to me, But I can make a difference for this one. Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen Effort is all you need to give, whether you succeed or fail. 9. The Old Man and the Donkey An old farmer and his grandson decided to take their donkey to the market to sell. To keep the donkey from getting tired so they could sell it for a good price, they tied its legs together and carried it between them. Not far along, passers-by laughed and said, You have a donkey and you're not riding it. That's silly. Realizing their mistake, the old man untied the donkey, let his grandson ride, and walked behind. After a while, a traveler saw this and scolded the grandson. You're so disrespectful letting your old grandfather walk while you ride. You should be the one walking. Taking this advice, the grandfather climbed onto the donkey, and the grandson walked behind. Next, they passed three women who commented, Poor boy, having to walk while the old man rides comfortably on the donkey. Acknowledging the point, the old man had his grandson join him on the donkey. Another group of people saw them and criticized, how cruel to make that poor donkey carry both of you. You have no compassion for your old animal. By the time you get to the market, you'll only have a donkey's hide to sell. So once again, both of them got off and walked, letting the donkey lead the way. Yet another passerby remarked, Why don't they just put that donkey in a glass case to worship? They're wearing out their shoes to protect the donkey. They're all three donkeys. That's when the old man finally said, Yes, I am the donkey here, but from now on, no matter what people say, whether they praise me or criticize me, I'm going to follow my own mind. 10. Buying Shoes A man from Trend decided he needed a new pair of shoes for walking. Before he left, he carefully measured his feet and left the drawing on his table. Upon reaching the market and entering a shoe store, he realized he had forgotten the drawing at home. He told the shop owner, Unfortunately, I've left my measurements at home. I'll have to go back to get them before I can buy. He hurried home to retrieve the drawing, but by the time he returned to the market, it had closed. So he ended up not buying any shoes. Someone asked him, Why didn't you just try on the shoes with your feet at that moment and buy them if they fit? He replied, I'd rather trust the measurements than my own feet. What a laughable situation. 11. A brother like that. I got a beautiful bicycle for my birthday. 
One day, while riding it in the park, a little boy kept circling around looking at my bike with excitement and admiration. Is this bike yours? The boy asked. My brother gave it to me for my birthday, I replied, clearly proud and satisfied. Oh, I wish I could. The boy hesitated. Of course, I thought he wished he had a brother like mine, but what he said next took me by surprise. I wish I could be a brother like that, he said, slowly, his face showing determination. Then he walked over to a bench behind me, where his little brother, who had a disability, was sitting and said, One day, for your birthday, I'm going to get you a wheelchair, okay? Looking back on the moments when you've bravely faced adversity, you'll realize that the times you truly lived were when you did something with all your heart, out of love. 12. The Rabbit and the Cow A rabbit was being chased by a dog and couldn't find any place to hide. Suddenly, the rabbit saw an old cow munching grass by the roadside. While running, the rabbit cried out for help as the eager dog was closing in. The cow stepped forward, blocking the way and snorted loudly and menacingly, which scared the dog so much that it tucked its tail and ran away. Afterwards, the cow turned to the rabbit and asked, Why should I stand up for you and come to your aid? The rabbit replied, When death is breathing down your neck, even a stranger in front of you seems like a friend, let alone you and I who already know each other. 13. Lessons from Geese When you see geese flying in a V formation, you might wonder what science has discovered about why they fly this way. As a goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the goose flying behind it. By flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% more flying range than if each bird flew on its own. Those who share a common direction and sense of community can get where they're going quicker and easier because they are traveling in the same direction as those around them. When a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of trying to fly alone and quickly gets back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird in front. If we have as much sense as a goose, we will stay in formation with those who are headed the same way we are. When the lead goose gets tired, it rotates back in the wing and another goose flies point. Like geese, humans take turns doing the hard tasks and sharing leadership. The geese in the back honk to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. What message do we send when we honk from behind? Finally, when a goose gets sick or is wounded and falls out, two geese fall out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with the fallen goose until it is able to fly again or dies. Then they launch out on their own with another formation or to catch up with their flock. If we had the sense of a goose, we would stand by each other like that in tough times. 14. The Rabbit, the Tiger, and the Test of Friendship Seeing a tiger sleeping soundly with a snake beside it, the rabbit thought to himself, Oh no, what if the snake bites the tiger? I must wake the tiger up. Despite being terrified, Rabbit bravely tugged at the tiger's tail. Who dares to wake me up? the tiger roared. Please forgive me, it's just me, the rabbit said softly. Be careful, a snake. The tiger turned around, saw the green snake, and quickly jumped away. Give me your hand, the tiger said to the rabbit. You are brave and noble. From now on, we are friends and I will protect you. You don't have to be afraid of anyone now. The rabbit was very happy. Suddenly, a fox peeked out from the bushes. The rabbit ran away as fast as the wind. The tiger was surprised and shook his head, not understanding. In the evening, the tiger found the rabbit. Why did you run away? I saw the fox. But I was with you, and I promised to protect you. Yes, you did promise. Don't you trust me? Yes, I do. Then do you think that fox is stronger than me? No, you are stronger. Then why did you still run away? 
It's a bad habit of us rabbits, the rabbit admitted shyly. <laughs> hey, everyone. Your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So, let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. 15. Dare to Believe A boy crossed the baseball field, cap neatly on his head, bat and ball in hand, proudly telling himself, I'm the best baseball player in the world. After saying this, he tossed the ball up, swung hard, but missed. Unfazed, he picked up the ball, threw it high again, and muttered, I'll always be the best player. He swung the bat once more, but just like before, he missed. The boy paused for a moment to carefully check his ball and bat. Once again, as he threw the ball, he declared, I am the greatest player in history. He swung his bat with all his might and missed again. Wow, the boy exclaimed. What a fantastic pitcher I am. 16. Little Adam after recovering from her second heart surgery at a children's hospital in western Ontario, my six-year-old daughter Kelly moved from the intensive care unit to a general ward with other patients. Because a part of this ward was not in use, Kelly had to share a room designated for cancer patients. Next door, a six-year-old boy named Adam was battling leukemia. Adam had to come to the hospital every month for chemotherapy treatments. During these visits, he often came to Kelly's room to play, bringing along his chemotherapy medication bag. Despite the discomfort from his treatments, Adam was always smiling and cheerful. He could keep us laughing for hours with his stories. Adam always found something positive and funny in every situation, even when it was tough. On the day Kelly was discharged, I felt tired and worried for her. The gloomy weather outside made me feel even sadder. As I stood looking at the rain through the window, Adam came to our room to play as usual. I told him that it was a really dreary day. With his ever-present bright smile, Adam turned to me and happily said, To me, every day is beautiful. From that day on, I never had a dreary day again. Even the gloomiest days felt cheerful and pleasant when I remembered the wise words of the brave six-year-old boy named Adam. Your attitude can truly change your experience of life. 17. Courage A young girl fell ill with a rare and dangerous disease. The only chance to save her was a blood transfusion from her five-year-old brother, who had miraculously survived the same illness because his body produced antibodies against the disease. The doctor explained this to the boy and asked if he was willing to give his blood to save his sister. After a moment's hesitation, he took a deep breath and said, I'll do it if it means my sister will get better. As the transfusion took place, the siblings lay on beds close to each other. The boy smiled as he saw color return to his sister's cheeks, but then his face turned pale and his smile faded. Looking at the doctor with a shaky voice, he asked, Am I going to die soon? Please, try to save my sister. The boy had misunderstood the doctor, thinking he had to give all his blood to save his sister. Courage helps us face our fears, control them, not run from them. 18. Be yourself. You don't have to be like your mom unless you want to be. You also don't need to be like your grandmother, your great-grandmother, or anyone from your dad's side of the family. You might inherit a chin, a build, or a pair of eyes from them, but you don't have to be like anyone who came before you. You don't have to live their lives. If you inherit something from your family line, choose to embrace strength and resilience because the only person you really need to be like is the person you decide to be. Once President Calvin Coolidge invited some hometown friends over for dinner at the White House. Worried about proper dining etiquette, the guests decided to just copy whatever Coolidge did. Everything went smoothly until the coffee was served. The president poured coffee into his saucer. The guests did the same. 
Coolidge added sugar and cream to his. The guests followed suit. Then Coolidge bent down and placed the saucer on the floor for his cat. 19. What really matters, a few years ago, at a Special Olympics event in Seattle, nine athletes lined up at the starting line for a 95-meter dash. Each one had a physical or intellectual disability. When the starting gun went off, they all took off, determined to win the race. Suddenly, one boy tripped and fell. He tried to get up but fell again and started crying. The other eight athletes slowed down and stopped. They all turned back and went to help the boy. A girl with Down syndrome bent down, gave him a kiss and said, This will make you feel better. Then all nine athletes joined hands and walked to the finish line together. Everyone in the stadium stood up and cheered for the athletes nonstop for ten minutes. 20. The Last Wish the wolf decided to hang himself and let the whole forest know about his decision. No way he's actually going to hang himself. Wait and see, the rabbit said mockingly. He really might do it. He's quite determined, the turtle added. He could change his mind, said the hedgehog. He won't change his mind, not a chance. He's even picked out a willow tree for it, the crow insisted. He's off to find some rope now. The forest was abuzz with debates and discussions. Some believed it, others were skeptical. The news reached the stork, who immediately flew into the forest to find the wolf. He found the wolf sitting sadly under the willow tree, looking as gloomy as wilted leaves. The stork's heart tightened with pain. Although he had never been fond of the wolf and never really welcomed him, the thought of the wolf in such despair was a tragedy in itself. Hello, Mr. Wolf, greeted the stork softly. Hello, and goodbye, the wolf replied, wiping away a tear. Farewell. Don't be sad. Please forgive me if I've done anything wrong. You're really going to hang yourself? asked the stork, cautiously incredulous. I can't believe it. Why? What happened? I've been humiliated ridiculed in both fables and fairy tales. I don't want to live another day. Please, find me a rope in the storage room. It's locked, but people trust you. You can go. All right, I'll help you, the stork agreed without hesitation. Thank you so much, the wolf said, moved. Oh, and while you're at it, could you bring me a little goat too? Try to fulfill my last wish. The stork did fulfill the wolf's last wish. But the wolf didn't go through with hanging himself. He had a change of heart. 21. The Eternal Optimist We were blessed with three wonderful sons. Our middle son, Billy, is known as the Eternal Optimist. He's always the first to wake up, running into our bedroom by 5 a.m. Despite our reminders to stay quiet and go back to sleep, He'd whisper in protest, Today's going to be a beautiful day. I can hear the birds singing outside. When we'd tell Billy to be quiet, he'd reply, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to myself. In preschool, his teacher had the class draw a tiger. Billy isn't much of an artist, and his tiger had one eye closed and the other half open. When asked why his tiger was winking, Billy said, Because it's saying... I've got my eye on you, kid. Once, he argued with his older brother about whether a man on TV was really bald. Billy insisted, he's not bald. He only looks bald to you. When you're not looking, he has lots of hair. Our youngest son fell seriously ill with a kidney disease on a Tuesday and passed away by Friday of the same week. The evening after Tanner's funeral, I lay beside Billy for our usual chat. That night, we lay in the dark, mostly silent, until suddenly Billy said to me, I'm really sad about what happened to our family, but I'm even sadder for a lot of other people. Who was he talking about? Those who never got to know Tanner. Aren't we lucky to have had him for 20 months? Look, there are so many people who never got the chance to see him at all. Our family is really lucky. 22. 
Rich and Poor By chance, I overheard a conversation between two students from the same class. What do you usually do on Saturday nights? Weekend parties with friends, coffee hangouts, bar hopping, basically an all-nighter. Living it up, huh? I've got the money. What about you? Probably just buy a new book that came out yesterday and read it in the dorm. Such a country bumpkin. On Saturday nights, Saigon dazzles with lights. Motorbikes of all sorts, adorned in flashy colors, zip by like the wind. Young men and women, around 19 or 20, chat and laugh loudly on the streets. Stalls line up two, then three in a row, blocking the way for vehicles behind as people stroll by, joking and swerving. Cafes, supermarkets, and clubs are bustling with young people coming and going. Amidst the noisy stream of vehicles, I suddenly spot the petite figure of my classmate, pausing by a discount book stand on the sidewalk. What are you looking for? Some really good books about life. She smiles very happily. Not going out this weekend? No, too broke to go out, spent all my money on books. Then the little friend pedals away, very happy and confident. No, my friend, you are not poor when you use those few coins to enrich yourself. Meanwhile, tonight, there are rich folks who are making themselves poor with millions earned from their parents' sweat and tears. True wealth isn't always about gold and silver, and living a long life isn't just about longevity. 23. The King and the Parrot The king and the prince each had a parrot. The two parrots were father and son. The king deeply adored the father parrot, while the prince preferred the younger parrot. Additionally, the prince kept a very beautiful sparrow, which brought him a lot of happiness. One day, the younger parrot and the sparrow fought over some roasted meat, leading to a fierce argument. In the end, the sparrow was nearly pecked to death by the younger parrot. The injured sparrow looked pitiful, with its head retracted and wings drooped. The prince was furious and ordered the young parrot to be killed. When the father parrot learned of this, he was heartbroken. In a rage, he flew at the prince and pecked out his eyes. Fearing the king's revenge, the father parrot flew to a pine tree and hid at the top. The king, wanting to trick the father parrot into returning, went to the base of the pine tree and said, My beloved parrot, please come back to me. No, I can't return, the father parrot firmly replied. Come back and we can live as we did before. The king gently persuaded, If I return, you will kill me. We are friends. Why would I kill you? Because you want to avenge your son. I promise I won't harm you. The prince was wrong to kill your child. Your majesty, how can I trust you? Fly into this cage, I assure you. Trusting the king's words, the father parrot flew into the cage. The king grabbed the parrot and bitterly said, we were friends. You shouldn't have blinded my son. You will be punished. Moral of the story. Even among friends, one should not blindly trust everything they say. Sometimes friends can turn out to be the scariest enemies. 24. The Woodcutter and the God Hermes One day, a woodcutter went to the river to chop some wood. Suddenly, his axe slipped from his hands and fell into the river with a splash. The strong current quickly swept the axe away. The woodcutter sat on the riverbank and cried. His cries caught the attention of Hermes, the god of herdsmen and woodlands. Hermes appeared and asked, Why are you so upset? The woodcutter replied, Oh, dear God, I've lost my axe in the river. Hermes walked down to the river and after a while came back holding a golden axe. He asked the woodcutter, Is this your axe? The woodcutter looked at the axe and said, No, that's not mine. Mine was different. Hermes dove again and this time came back with a silver axe. He asked, Is this one yours? The woodcutter replied, No, that's not it either. Hermes went down once more and brought up the woodcutter's iron axe. 
Seeing his own axe, the woodcutter was overjoyed and said, Thank you, God. That's indeed my axe. Impressed by the woodcutter's honesty, Hermes rewarded him with both the gold and silver axes in addition to his own. The woodcutter took all three axes home and shared his story with the villagers. Hearing the story, another man decided to try his luck. He went to the river, threw his axe into the water letting the current take it, and then sat by the river wailing loudly. Hearing the cries, Hermes appeared and asked, Why are you crying? Oh dear God, the man replied. My axe has fallen into the river. Please help me retrieve it. Hermes pulled up a golden axe and asked if it was his. The man, elated, claimed, Yes, that's mine. Seeing the man's dishonesty, Hermes not only refused to give him the golden axe, but also didn't retrieve his iron axe. Moral of the story, honesty is a valued virtue. An honest person will be trusted and respected by others. 25. The Wolf and the Goat a goat fell behind its herd and was chased closely by a wolf. The goat turned around and said to the wolf, Sir, I know I must be your meal, but to make your dining more enjoyable, how about you play some music and I'll dance for you? The wolf began to play the flute and the goat danced wildly. The farm dogs heard the commotion and came running to chase the wolf away. As the wolf ran, he looked back at the goat and said, I lost to you because I, a butcher, foolishly turned into a musician and missed my chance. 26. The Thief and His Mother There was a kid who liked to steal things from a young age. One day he came home from school with an extra student slate in his bag. His mom asked, Why do you have two slates? The child replied, One is from a classmate. I sneaked it into my bag. The mother happily said, My child is so smart. Two slates are definitely better than one. Not long after, the child brought home a leather jacket worth 50 coins. He gave the jacket to his mom, who praised him. My son is so clever, always thinking of his mom. Give me a kiss. As the boy grew, he started stealing more valuable items. Today, he would steal cattle, tomorrow horses, and then jewels and gold. His mother always praised him, and whenever they needed something, she would suggest he steal it. One day, the boy was caught stealing and was taken to the authorities. Because he had stolen so much, he was sentenced to death. With his hands tied behind his back, he was led to the execution ground, followed by his crying mother. At the execution site, he asked to speak to his mother. When she came close, he bit her ear hard. She screamed in pain, scolding him. You ungrateful child! Isn't it enough that your crimes have brought you to this end without trying to hurt your own mother too? The son angrily told her, The first time I stole a slate and you praised me instead of punishing me. If you had corrected me then, I wouldn't have ended up like this, sentenced to death. The moral of the story, when you do something wrong, even if it's a small mistake, it's important to correct it right away. Otherwise, letting it grow into a bigger problem could lead to lifelong regret. 27. Taking a chance. Two seeds were lying next to each other on a piece of fertile land. The first seed said, I want to grow. I want to send my roots deep into the soil below and push my sprouts through the tough earth above. I want to unfold my petals softly as a sign of greeting to the spring. I want to feel the warmth of the sun on my face and taste the morning dew on my petals. And so, the first seed grew. The second seed said, I'm scared. If I send my roots down into the dark soil below, I don't know what dangers I might encounter. If I try to push through the hard soil above, I might damage my delicate sprouts. And even if my sprouts manage to grow, snails might come and eat them. Someday, if my flowers do bloom, kids might just pick them. No, it's better to stay here until it feels completely safe. And so, the second seed waited. One spring morning, 
A hen wandering around for food spotted the lonely seed and pecked it up immediately. You see, those who don't dare to take risks and grow will be overwhelmed by life. When we hide in safety, we create a world filled with insecurities. 29. The Old Woman Who Always Cried There was an old woman known as the old woman who always cried. She cried when it rained and cried when it was clear. She often sold incense outside the gates of a monastery. One day, a monk asked her, Old lady, why do you cry so much? She replied, I have two daughters. The older one married a cloth shoemaker and the younger one married an umbrella maker. On sunny days, I feel sorry for the younger one because no one buys her umbrellas. On rainy days, I feel sorry for the older one. Who would buy cloth shoes in the rain? The monk advised, Old lady, you should rejoice for your older daughter when it's sunny because her shoes will sell, and be happy for your younger daughter when it rains because her umbrellas will be in demand. Ah, right! From that day on, the old woman who always cried stopped crying. Whether it rained or shone, she would just smile broadly. Whether something is good or bad depends on how we see it. 30. The Misbehaved Dog There was a dog that would attack anyone it encountered so suddenly that no one expected it until it bit them on the heel. To warn strangers and punish the dog, its owner sometimes hung a bell around its neck and at other times made it drag a heavy log, which was tied to its collar by a chain. At first, the dog hung its head low, but when it saw that the bell and log drew more attention to itself, it became proud and strutted around the market to show them off. It even acted arrogantly and boastfully towards other dogs that didn't have such adornments. Seeing this, an old hunting dog said, Why do you strut around as if that bell and log are trophies? Sure, they make people notice you, but once they understand what they really mean, they're actually a mark of shame for you and a constant reminder that you're a misbehaved dog. Being famous for good qualities is one thing, but being infamous for your faults is quite another. 31. The Fox and the Leopard Once upon a time, a fox and a leopard were arguing about who was more beautiful. The leopard was showing off the spots all over its fur. The fox, who was prouder of its cleverness than its looks, finally interrupted the leopard's boasting with a statement like this. No matter what you say, I'm still way more beautiful than you. My beauty isn't just skin deep. It also shines through my intelligence. What really matters about a person is more important than how they look on the outside. 32. The Hand on Thanksgiving Day, a first-grade teacher asked her students to draw a picture of what they were thankful for. She wanted to see what these underprivileged kids were truly grateful for. She expected most of the students to draw pictures of turkeys or tables filled with food. But she was surprised to see the drawing by a boy named Douglas, which simply and naively depicted a hand. Why did Douglas draw a hand? And whose hand was it? The whole class was intrigued by Douglas's drawing. I think it must be God's hand bringing us food, one boy said. It's a farmer's hand, another chimed in, because he raises the turkeys. Finally, when the other students were busy with their work, the teacher bent down by Douglas's desk and asked him whose hand it was. It's your hand, teacher, he whispered. This reminded her that she often held Douglas's hand during recess. She did this with other students, too. But for Douglas, a quiet and lonely child, it meant the world. Perhaps this was what Thanksgiving was truly about for everyone, not the material things we receive, but the small, significant acts we give to others. 33. Things That Stay With Me one day, as I was sitting quietly in a room waiting for an appointment, an odd feeling washed over me. I quickly checked to make sure I wasn't dreaming, and I realized I had wandered farther than anyone's dream could ever take them. 
Each of my thoughts was like a drop of water falling onto the surface of a still lake, and I was amazed at the peace in each silent moment that passed. Suddenly my mother's face appeared. Her face before the cruel Alzheimer's disease took her memory, her sense of self, and more than twenty-two pounds from her. Her beautiful silver hair framed her delicate face. She seemed so real and close that I felt like I could reach out and touch her. I could even smell Joy perfume, her favorite. It seemed like she was waiting for something and said nothing. Mom, I'm so sorry you had to endure such a terrible disease, I said. She gently shook her head, as if she understood the hardship she had gone through. Then she smiled, a warm, loving smile, and clearly said, But all I remember is your love. And then she was gone. I shivered as the room suddenly felt cold, and I knew that only the love we give and receive is what we truly remember. All pain will pass, but love remains forever. My mother's words are the most precious things I've ever heard, and that moment is etched deeply in my heart. 34. Source of Encouragement Some of the greatest success stories in history started with a word of encouragement and trust from a loved one or a trustworthy friend. If it wasn't for Sophia's strong belief, we might not have discovered Nathaniel Hawthorne among the great names in American literature. When Nathaniel came home distressed and told his wife that he had lost his job, her joyful reaction surprised him. Now you have time to write your book, she exclaimed happily. I know, he replied, not very confidently. But how will we live while I write? To her husband's astonishment, Sophia opened a drawer and took out a significant amount of money. Where did you get that money? he exclaimed. I've always known you were a genius, she said. I knew that one day you would write a masterpiece. So, every week, I saved a little from the grocery money you gave me. This is enough to keep us going for a year. With his wife's faith and expectation, one of the greatest novels in American literature was born, The Scarlet Letter. It doesn't take much to make someone happy. Just a gesture if you know how, just a timely word, a small adjustment to a pin, a screw or a nut in the delicate machinery of your soul. 35. A Lesson from a Martial Arts Teacher Happiness or misery is mostly decided by your character, not by your circumstances. A ten-year-old boy decided to learn judo even though he had lost his left arm in a car accident. He started training with a Japanese judo master. Believing he had been diligently learning and making progress, the boy was puzzled as to why. After three months of training, the master had only taught him one judo move. Finally, running out of patience, the boy asked, Master, why can't I learn other moves? The master replied, This is the only move I'm teaching you, and it's the only one you need to learn. Not fully understanding but trusting his teacher, the boy continued to practice. Months later, the master took the boy to a judo competition. The boy was surprised to win the first two matches easily. The third match was more challenging, but as the opponent grew impatient with his attacks, the boy cleverly used his move and won. Still amazed by his success, he confidently entered the finals. This time, his opponent was a bigger, stronger, and more experienced fighter. Early in the match, the boy was hit repeatedly and completely dominated. After the first round, fearing the boy might get hurt, the referee signaled to end the match early, but the boy's master refused. Let him continue, the master insisted. As the match resumed, the opponent made a critical mistake. He underestimated the boy and let his guard down. The boy used his single move to throw his opponent to the ground and pin him. The boy won the championship. On their way home, the master and the boy reviewed every match. The boy finally gathered the courage to voice the question that had been haunting him. Master, how did I win the championship with just one move? You won for two reasons, the master answered. First, you've almost mastered one of the most dangerous and effective moves in this martial art. 
Second, the only way to counter that move is to grab your left arm, which you don't have. Sometimes, what seems like a weakness can turn into your greatest strength. It's good to have strengths, but turning a weakness into an advantage is even more remarkable. Believe in yourself. You can achieve anything. 36. There are eyes that follow you. There are eyes that watch you every day. There are ears that listen to every word you say. There are hands, eager to do as you do. And there's a sweet kid, dreaming of being just like you someday. You've become the hero of this lovely child. The kid believes wholeheartedly that you're the smartest, without any doubt. They put their trust in you, hanging on your every word, following your every move. And the kid will speak and the kid will act, just as you have done. There's a kid with bright, keen eyes, convinced that you're always right, watching you every day. You're shining bright through your actions. The kid will watch and learn, aiming to grow up to be just like you. 37. The Eagle and the Sparrow In a certain forest, there was a very proud and boastful eagle. Whenever it met any other bird, the eagle would brag about being the king of all birds, claiming it was the strongest, loudest, and could fly the highest. One day, the eagle gathered all the birds together and challenged them. Hey, birds, is there anyone among you brave enough to compete with me in loudness, eating a lot, or flying high? All the birds looked at each other in fear and remained silent. Seeing this, the eagle grew even more arrogant. I'm above all of you, it declared. Just then, a little sparrow spoke up. Mr. Eagle, I might not dare to compete in eating a lot or being loud, but I'll try my luck in flying high with you. Both the eagle and the other birds were surprised to hear the sparrow speak up, but it was not intimidated. The contest began. The eagle flapped its wings and soared upwards. When it was higher than the tallest trees, the eagle called out, Hey, little sparrow, where did you drop to? At that moment, the sparrow flew over the eagle's head and replied, I'm here. Don't worry. I haven't given up. The eagle, determined not to be outdone, flew even higher. When it was above the misty mountain peaks, the eagle shouted again, How about it, little sparrow, still following me? The sparrow flew up again and answered, Yes, I'm still keeping up. Are you getting tired that you're flying so slowly? Never! The eagle, panting, flew upwards, reaching above the clouds, convinced that the sparrow couldn't possibly follow to such heights. Its wings were weary, and its neck and head felt heavy. Barely able to speak, the eagle gasped, Little sparrow, you've given up, haven't you? Not at all. I'm still above you, replied the sparrow, still sounding cheerful. The eagle, refusing to lose to the sparrow, pushed itself to climb higher but couldn't go any further. Exhausted, the eagle collapsed and fell from the sky like a stone. Meanwhile, the sparrow simply spread its wings and gently descended among the eager birds waiting for news of the contest. They couldn't understand how the sparrow, with its cleverness and courage, managed to win against the much larger and seemingly superior eagle. Only another little sparrow had noticed at the start of the contest that the challenger had perched itself on the eagle's back. It turned out the eagle had unwittingly carried the sparrow on its back without realizing it. Each time the eagle called out, the sparrow would fly up from its back to respond, conserving its energy throughout the contest. Through its wit and bravery, the little sparrow triumphed over the proud and much larger eagle, 38. Good news? Robert de Vincenzo, an excellent golfer from Argentina, once won a tournament. After receiving his prize money and taking photos with the press, he headed back to the clubhouse to get ready to leave. A little while later, as he was walking alone to the parking lot, a young woman approached him. She congratulated him on his victory and then shared her story about her seriously ill child who was not expected to survive. 
She didn't know how she would manage to pay for the medical bills and hospital fees for her child. Moved by her story, De Vincenzo signed the back of his prize check and handed it to the woman. Please take this for your child, he said, pressing the check into her hand. The following week, during a lunch at the club, an official from the Professional Golfers Association came over to him and said, The kids in the parking lot last week told me you met a woman there after the tournament. De Vincenzo nodded. The official continued, Well, I have something to tell you. She's a con artist. She doesn't have a sick child at all. She's not even married. You were scammed, my friend. De Vincenzo asked, So, you mean to say there is no dying child at all? That's right, the official replied. That's the best news I've heard this week, De Vincenzo said. The two looked out at the evening sky through the window bars. One saw nothing but darkness while the other saw the twinkling stars. 39. The Crane, the Crab, and the Fish Near a lake there lived a very cunning crane. Every day it hunted in the lake, quickly catching any fish that came too close to the surface or the shore. With plenty of fish, shrimp, crabs, and frogs, the crane was never hungry. However, it was never satisfied and wanted to eat until there were no more crabs or fish left in the lake. One day, while searching for food far away, the crane saw another large lake. After catching a few big fish, it returned to its old lake with a sneaky plan to trick the fish. Hey, my dear fish friends, it said, today I flew far away and saw a large, beautiful lake on the other side of this forest. A fish popped up and asked the crane, What does that have to do with us? Just let me finish, the crane continued. On my way back, I overheard some people saying they'll drain this lake in a few days to catch all the fish. I'm so worried. If you all die, who will I live with? The naive little fish then told its family and friends what the crane said. Soon the fish gathered close to the shore, asking the crane for help. After much discussion, they agreed to let the crane carry a few of them at a time to the new lake and then come back for the others. Unfortunately, the fish fell for the crane's evil plan. The crane would dive down, grab a few fish, and fly straight to a large tree where it usually spent the night. It leisurely ate each fish, then threw the bones to the ground. The crane kept going back for more fish until it had eaten the entire school, piling up the bones under the tree. Now, it was the crab's turn. Knowing the crane was wicked, the crab was cautious. It let the crane grab onto its shell, but the crab's claws were tightly wrapped around the crane's neck. The crane flew towards the large tree. As they flew, the crab looked down but couldn't see the promised large, beautiful lake. Hey, crane, are we there yet? Almost, don't worry, the crane replied. The crab, growing suspicious, kept asking, Are we there yet? The lake you mentioned seems so far away. Almost there, just a bit further, said the crane, landing on its usual tree branch. Seeing a pile of white, clean bones at the tree's base, the crab realized the fish had been eaten by the crane. Immediately, the crab tightened its strong claws around the crane's neck. Despite the crane's attempts to escape, the crab wouldn't let go. It forced the crane to carry it back to the lake. In pain from the tight grip, the crane had no choice but to fly back. Before the crane could open its beak to release the crab, the crab snapped the crane's neck with all its might. With a final screech, the crane fell into the lake. That served the greedy and malicious crane right. 40. God's Gift God placed it in her hands on a warm summer day. She trembled with a strange emotion at the sight of its delicate form. It was a very special gift that God had entrusted to her, a gift that would one day belong to the world. Until that day came, he said she would be its guardian and protector. The young woman understood this and respectfully took the gift home, determined to be worthy of God's trust. At first, she couldn't take her eyes off it, shielding it from what she thought could cause harm. 
She anxiously watched every time it stepped out of the cozy cocoon she had tenderly placed it in. But then, the woman realized she couldn't keep it sheltered forever. It needed to learn to deal with life's thorns to grow strong. So, with deep care, she gave it space, enough for it to grow naturally and comfortably on its own. One day, she noticed the gift had changed a lot. It was no longer fragile and delicate. Now it was strong and sturdy, as if it held a power within. Over time, she saw the gift become tougher and more resilient. Deep in her heart, she knew her time with the gift was running short. The inevitable day came when God returned to take the gift and place it in the world. The woman felt a deep sadness because she would always remember its presence in her life. With sincere gratitude, she thanked God for the privilege of caring for such a precious gift over the years. Standing tall, she raised her head high, proud to know it truly was a very special gift. The gift would blend with the beauty and essence of the world around it. And so, the mother let her child step into life. 41. The Deer and the Wolves One day, all the wolves in the area gathered on the bank of the river Nat to share news and have some fun. There were young wolves, strong adult wolves, and a few old loners like Grey Wolf. At first, they sang the long, seemingly endless wolf song. The howling echoed through the forest, scaring other animals into running far away. Fish dove deep into the mud, some hiding under rocks. A salmon darted left and right to escape the dreadful noise, then swam upstream, leaping over waterfalls. It's said that it was then the salmon learned to overcome obstacles and swim upstream to its source. The sun was bothered by the wolves howling and decided to set early, hiding its face in the clouds to avoid the noise. In contrast, the moon was drawn to the wolf choir, peeking out from behind pine trees to get a better view. The wolves were thrilled to have an audience. Tired after a while, the wolves switched to another pastime, sharing old tales. They praised long-forgotten heroic deeds, and the old warriors showed the young ones the scars from ancient battles. Sitting in a circle, chatting about everything and nothing, they waited for the morning mist to rise from the river, signaling a new day. Across the river, a group of deer gathered. The mist carried the wolves' stories to their ears, and they couldn't help but laugh, amused that the animals only believed in their own kind's words. Who dares mock the brave wolves? A wolf asked. The warning didn't stop the deer from laughing. Hidden by the early morning fog, they felt safe from the wolves. But suddenly, the sun leaped into the sky, rubbed its eyes, and dispersed the fog to see what was happening below. Oh, the deer! The wolves howled across the river. You deer don't know how to laugh properly. Listen to this. The wolves bared their teeth, their fierce grins sparkling in the sunlight, and laughed loudly, filling the forest with their sound. The deer tried to respond. It's our turn. Mmm, mmm, mmm. They tried to laugh but couldn't make a sound, only showing their small, toothless gums. That's why the deer couldn't laugh, the wolves thought, seeing the deer as easy prey, their mouths watering. In an instant, they jumped into the water and swam to the other side. The deer hurriedly ran away. The wolves didn't lose their trail and have continued to chase deer ever since. Since that day, wolves have known that deer are delicious prey, with no means to defend themselves against the wolves' teeth. 42. The Golden Cranes Long ago, far from here, beyond the land of many fields, there was a flock of cranes with golden feathers. One day, the great spirit called Latakini, the leader of the cranes, and said, Latakini, your flock is the most beautiful among all birds. I have not given any other birds the golden feathers that you possess. I want you to stay in the place I have designated for you. Latakini asked, Why can't we fly to other places? Flying elsewhere would cause your wings to lose their beautiful golden glow. 
the great spirit answered, and then disappeared. Latakini fluffed up its golden feathers and spread its strong wings to fly a great distance. It went to inform the flock of the great spirit's command. Summer was nearing its end. Canadian geese, wild ducks, and herons came to Latakini's northern homeland. All the migratory birds signaled each other to gather and prepare for their annual journey south to warmer lands. Latakini grew restless. Day by day, it watched vast flocks disappear into the horizon. Night after night, it heard the endless flapping of wings against the dark sky. Then, one morning, it saw that their territory was empty, save for the cranes. Unable to resist the temptation, it signaled for the flock to take off. The great spirit was furious that the cranes disobeyed his command. He knew they had flown to the land of many fields and ordered all the water sources there to strip the golden glow from the wings of any crane that defied him. The golden cranes flew day and night across many strange lands without rest. At last, from high above, they saw a sun-drenched meadow filled with fields and sparkling lakes. They had reached their destination. Latakini lowered its wings, circled over a lake, and then plunged in, followed by the entire flock. As soon as they touched the water, a storm erupted. Waves rose high enough to drown the flock. The waves stripped their golden feathers and carried them far away, as commanded by the Great Spirit. Latakini signaled for the flock to rise, but it was too late. Gone was the cloud of golden birds that shone in the southern sun. Now, they were just white birds, forming a mist-like cluster. Only then did Latakini remember the Great Spirit's warning. Latakini comforted itself. When spring comes and we return to our northern homeland, perhaps the Great Spirit will restore our golden feathers. If so, I'll never disobey him again. I will not leave the area he has reserved for us. Eagerly awaiting spring when the migratory birds set off, Latakini called the flock to return home. Once more, the cranes flew for days and nights without rest. They landed in a meadow back home. Alas, it was as if snow had returned. The flock remained white. Latakini realized it would never regain its golden feathers for disobeying the Great Spirit's will. 43. The Four Wives, A Tale of Love, Neglect, and Enlightenment Once upon a time, there was a wealthy king who ruled a mighty kingdom. He had four beautiful wives. The king loved his fourth wife the most and always pampered her with the best of everything, never saying no. Next in line was his third wife, whom he always feared losing and wished to keep by his side wherever he went. His second wife was his confidant, always kind, gentle, and patient. Whenever the king faced problems, he would confide in her and often received valuable advice. The king's first wife was the most loyal, contributing to his reign and the kingdom's prosperity, yet the king didn't show much affection towards her. He often took her for granted, thinking she could manage on her own, thus seldom paying attention to her. Unfortunately, one day the king became ill and realized he didn't have much time left. He thought, I have four wives, but I'll be alone when I die. With this in mind, the king asked his fourth wife if she would accompany him in death to avoid loneliness. She replied that as much as he had been good to her, she couldn't fulfill this request. The king then asked his third wife, who also declined, saying life was still beautiful and she would find another king to cherish her. This left the king heartbroken and disappointed. Turning to his second wife, he asked if she would follow him, but she too declined, promising only to care for him till his last moments and remember him thereafter. The king was utterly despairing. He had almost forgotten about his first wife until he heard a voice saying she would follow him wherever he went, even in death. She was the first wife, looking tired and frail. The king was deeply saddened and regretful for not treating her better, realizing he should have cherished her more. 
This is a tale of a king and his queens, reminding us that we're all like that king in our own lives. We each have four wives. The fourth wife is our body, which we often care for the most, wanting to look our best. But when we pass away, our body returns to dust, leaving nothing behind. The third wife represents our status and wealth, the most fleeting of all, for they're merely material and will belong to someone else once we're gone. The second wife is our family and friends, who care for and support us, comforting and advising us, but can only be with us until the very end. The first wife is our soul, often neglected by those caught up in the pursuit of material wealth and status. Yet, it's the only thing that stays with us wherever we go and what people remember about us after we're gone. So, dear friend, take care and cherish your soul above all. Don't end up like the king in the story with a weakened and tired soul at life's end. 44. To always remember me. There will come a day when I'll lie on a neatly made white bed, tucked in at all four corners of the mattress, in a hospital always filled with people struggling between life and death. At some point, doctors will declare my brain has stopped working and that, essentially, my life has come to an end. When that happens, please don't try to keep me alive artificially with machines. And don't call it the bed where I died. Call it the bed of life and take my body to help others live fuller lives. Give my eyes to a man who has never seen the sunrise, a child's face, or the love in a woman's eyes. Donate my heart to someone living in constant pain with a diseased heart. Give my blood to a teenager pulled from the wreckage of a car so he can live to see his grandchildren play. Offer my kidneys to someone who spends their days attached to a dialysis machine. Use my bones, muscles, blood vessels, and nerves to enable a child with disabilities to walk. Examine every nook and cranny of my brain. Take cells if needed and grow them so that, someday, a mute boy will shout at the top of his lungs during a sports game and a deaf girl will hear the sound of rain against her window. What remains of me, please cremate and scatter the ashes to help trees grow and blossom. If you must bury something, let it be my faults, weaknesses, and any prejudices against my fellow humans. Give my sins to the devil and my soul to God. If you wish to remember me, do it with an act of kindness or words of love to someone who needs you. If you do all I've asked, I will live on forever. 45. Our Little Almy Rose With two months to go before Christmas, our nine-year-old daughter, Almy Rose, mentioned she wanted a new bicycle. But as Christmas drew closer, she seemed to forget all about that wish. We got her the trendy nurse doll set along with a dollhouse, thinking that would make her happy. However, to our surprise, two days before Christmas, Almy Rose still expressed a preference for a bicycle over any other toy in the world. By then, it was too late. With hundreds of Christmas preparations and last-minute gifts to buy, we had no time to pick out the perfect bicycle for Almy Rose. So, at 9 p.m. on Christmas Eve, with Almy Rose and her six-year-old brother Dylan snug in their beds, my spouse and I were still up, worried about disappointing our daughter. What if I make a bicycle out of clay and write a note saying she could exchange it for a real one, my husband suggested. It seemed like a good idea, considering bicycles are hard to come by, and she was mature enough not to fuss over gifts. So my husband spent four hours crafting a miniature bike out of clay. On Christmas morning, we were anxious for Almy Rose to open the heart-shaped gift containing the red and white clay bicycle. Finally, she opened it and read the note aloud. Is it true I can exchange this clay bike Dad made for a real one? She asked. Yes, sweetheart, I beamed. Tears sparkled in Almy Rose's eyes as she replied, I will never trade this bicycle Dad made for me. I'd rather keep this one than have a real bike. 
In that moment, we felt so joyful we would have traveled to the ends of the earth to get our daughter any bicycle she wanted. 46. Live with your dreams. Dare to nurture and desire your dreams because they are the drive that helps you achieve your goals. My friend owns a horse ranch in San Isidro named Monty Roberts. His ranch often hosts fundraisers to help local youths with their projects. One time he shared this story. A long time ago, a poor boy used to accompany his father from one horse stable to another, from racetrack to farm, helping him train horses. One day, his teacher asked the students to write about their dreams, while others wrote about becoming engineers, doctors, soccer players, actors. This boy detailed his dream of someday owning a horse ranch. He even drew a ranch layout marking all the buildings, stables, and racetracks. That day, the boy received a big F on his paper, along with a note from his teacher to see him after class. Here's what the teacher told him. This is a fanciful dream for a kid like you. You don't have the means to do this. Do you realize how much money it takes to own a horse ranch? For buying breeding horses, land for the ranch. You need to set more realistic goals for yourself. If you rewrite your paper with a different dream, I'll reconsider your grade. The boy thought hard all week. He decided to consult his father on what to do. His father said, Son, it's up to you to decide. This is very important to you. After much thought, the boy resubmitted the same unchanged paper, bravely saying, Sir, I'd rather keep my dream and accept the failing grade. Ending his story, Monty Roberts said, Now, I'm telling you this because you're sitting in the middle of my 200-acre horse ranch. I still have that test. It's framed above my fireplace. Pausing, he added, Interestingly, Two summers ago, my former teacher brought his students to camp here for a week. Before he left, he told me, Monty, you taught me the importance of striving to live with your dreams. 47. It's never too late. Years ago, during a communication course I attended, I was introduced to an unusual teaching method. The instructor asked us to list everything we still felt ashamed of, guilty about, or had yet to complete. Over the next week, the instructor invited students to share their lists aloud. Since these were very personal matters, only a few brave individuals volunteered to share in front of the whole class. As people shared, my list of regrets grew longer, surpassing 101 items in just three weeks. The instructor then encouraged us to find ways to address these actions, either by apologizing or making amends for our mistakes. Honestly, I was hesitant, wondering if this approach would really improve my relationships, considering the possibility of being met with cold shoulders. The following week, the person sitting next to me volunteered to share their story. I was writing down my mistakes when I remembered an incident from my high school days in a small town in Iowa. Back then, we couldn't stand Brown, the local sheriff. One night, after having a few beers, my two friends and I decided to pull a prank on him. We found a can of red paint, climbed up the town's water tank in the middle of the street, and wrote in big, bright red letters, Sheriff Brown is a jerk. The next day, those bright letters stood out under the sun, catching everyone's eye. In less than two hours, Brown had us all at the police station. My friends confessed, but I denied everything and got away with it. Nearly 20 years later, Sheriff Brown suddenly appeared on my list. I wasn't sure if he was still alive. Last weekend, I called the information office in that Iowa town and found a Roger Brown. I dialed the number they gave me, and after a few rings, someone answered. Hello? I said. Are you Sheriff Brown? Yes, came the reply after a brief silence. I'm Jimmy Calkins. I want you to know that I was the one who vandalized the water tank back then. There was silence again. Then suddenly he exclaimed, I knew it. We both laughed heartily and had a pleasant conversation. Before hanging up, Brown told me, Jimmy, back then, I felt sorry for you. 
because your friends were able to relieve themselves of the burden of their youthful indiscretion while you carried it with you all these years. I'm glad you called for your own peace of mind. Jimmy's story gave me the courage to cleanse all 101 of my mistakes. It took nearly two years, but it marked the beginning and became a real inspiration for me to choose a career in conflict resolution. No matter how tough the conflict or disagreement, I always remind myself, it's never too late to clear the past and start anew. Every experience we go through is beneficial to us. What matters is having the right attitude to accept and understand its true meaning and value. 48. The Fingers Debate One day, the fingers argued about which one of them was the most important. Initially, the middle finger claimed, I'm in the center of the hand. Without me, the hand wouldn't look right. The other fingers countered, Even though you're in the middle and taller than us, you just sit there looking important without actually helping the hand to grasp or hold anything. The ring finger, with a touch of pride, stated it was the most crucial because it carries the symbol of the owner's maturity, which is the wedding ring. But the others laughed and said, Better if you stayed quiet. The boss keeps that wedding ring in his pocket more often to make the young ladies think he's not married. What else do you do? The most important is me, the index finger exclaimed. Who points the way? Who highlights the flaws in a plan? It's me. Listen to the boss saying, Folks, the reason for our delay is right here. Everybody fears my pointing because no one wants to be blamed for the team's setbacks. You're mistaken, dear friend, the thumb interjected. You're not the only one who can point. I do too, but in a more sophisticated and discreet way. I don't point directly at people, but indicate to the right, behind their back, yet still accurately identify the culprit. Moreover, in some cases, when wanting to deflect responsibility, I help the boss point the guest to another door to someone else to ask, complain. The little finger had been quiet all along. And why would it boast? It was the smallest finger. But then, hey, why isn't the pinky saying anything? The others asked. I can point too. Since I'm so small, when the boss needs to self-criticize, he uses me to point at his chest so no one really sees. Also, I come in handy when needing to make a pact. Just a word, and both parties hook me together. Sometimes I really make a difference. 49. The Daydreaming Milkmaid In a certain farm, there was a milkmaid of average looks. Her daily tasks involved feeding the dairy cows and milking them. As a result, her clothes were always splattered with milk and her face and hair got quite messy. The milkmaid loved to daydream about becoming beautiful. One day, after she had finished milking, she balanced the milk jug on her head and started walking back to the farm. Soon, she began to fantasize. When will I get to wear new dresses? Next year or the year after? No, I don't want to wait that long. I've talked about this with my mom several times, but she doesn't seem to care. Right. Why don't I ask my mom for this milk jug? I could sell it and buy 300 chicken eggs with the money. Even if some eggs don't hatch, I should get at least 250 chicks. I'll fatten them up, and by autumn, they'll be plump hens and roosters. When the price of chickens is at its highest, I'll sell them in the market. By then, I'll have made enough money to buy a beautiful new dress. I'll wear it to the Christmas party. All the young men will compete to propose to me, but I'll shake my head and refuse them all. Lost in this fantasy, the milkmaid shook her head, causing the milk jug to fall and spill all the milk on the ground, shattering her beautiful daydreams as well. Moral. No matter how beautiful a dream may be, it can't suddenly become reality. To turn dreams into reality, one must take proactive steps. 50. The Train Station of Life Deep in our minds lies a countryside scene. We're on a train, mesmerized by the fleeting landscapes outside our window, children waving along the tracks, 
livestock grazing on hill slopes, rows of corn and wheat, flat plains, rolling valleys, mountains, and distant villages against the skyline. But what really occupies our minds is the final destination. One day we'll arrive at the station, bands will play, and flags will wave. Upon arrival, all our dreams will come true, and every aspect of life will come together like a perfectly assembled jigsaw puzzle. This anticipation keeps us restless, pacing up and down, counting every minute, waiting, waiting, waiting to reach the station. How happy I'll be when we get to the station, we exclaim, thinking, when I'm 18, when I buy a Mercedes-Benz 450 SL, when my youngest child goes off to college, when I've paid off the mortgage, when I get promoted, when I retire, I'll live a relaxed, happy life. Sooner or later, we realize there's no such station, no place to arrive at. The true joy of life is found in the journey itself. The station is but a dream, always out of our reach. Live in the moment is sound advice, especially when paired with the scripture. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Isn't it today's burdens that wear us down? No, it's the regrets of yesterday and the fears of tomorrow. Regret and fear are thieves that rob us of our present. So, stop pacing the aisles and counting the miles. Instead, climb more mountains, eat lots of ice cream, walk barefoot more often, swim in the cool rivers, watch sunsets, laugh more, and cry less. Life is a journey we're on, and soon enough we'll reach our station. Never regret the past. The real life is today, and you will build your own future. 51. What We Never Said My son Joey was born with a birth defect in his legs. The doctors assured us that after treatment, he could walk normally, but running would be a real challenge. For the first three years of his life, Joey underwent countless surgeries and was often in casts and bandages. By the time he was eight, you couldn't tell there was anything wrong with his legs when he walked. Like any other kid his age, Joey loved to run and play tag with his friends without any hesitation. We never told him that he might never run like the other kids. So, my son never knew that. In seventh grade, Joey decided to join the school's cross-country team. He trained with the team every day. Joey worked harder and ran more than anyone else on the team, probably because he felt that while running was natural for everyone else, it was a bit harder for him. Even though the whole team trained together, only the top seven runners who could potentially win for the school were selected to compete. We never told Joey that it would be hard for him to be among those top runners, so my son never knew that. Joey would run four to five miles a day, even when he had a fever of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. That day, I was worried, so I decided to check on him during his practice after school. When I arrived, I saw Joey running alone. When I asked, he simply said, I'm fine. He still had two more miles to complete his run for the day. Sweat poured down my son's face and his eyes were glazed over from the fever. Yet, Joey kept his gaze forward and continued to run. We never said that he couldn't run four miles with a high fever. So, my son never knew that. Two weeks later, the names of the team members selected for the cross-country team were announced. Joey was the sixth name on the list. My son made the team. He was the only 7th grader while the rest were 8th graders. We never told our son that he couldn't do it. And because we never said that, Joey never knew. He just kept trying his best. Only time has the power to polish a raw stone into a shining gem, to transform an ordinary person into a great figure. And it's also only time that proves the truest values. 52. True love, Moses Mendelssohn, the grandfather of the famous German composer, wasn't much to look at. He was short and had a hunchback. One day he visited a merchant in Hamburg who had a lovely daughter named Frumtje. 
Upon seeing her, Moses fell deeply in love but felt hopeless because she seemed frightened by his appearance. When it was time to leave, Moses gathered his courage to climb the stairs to her room, hoping for one last chance to speak with her. To him, she was the epitome of angelic beauty, yet she saddened him by avoiding his gaze. After struggling through some small talk, Moses awkwardly asked her, Do you believe that marriages are made in heaven before we're born? I do, she replied, looking down at the floor. And you? Yes, I believe so, he said. You see, in heaven, when a boy is born, God tells him who his wife will be. When I was born, my future wife was also revealed to me. God even mentioned that my wife would have a hunchback. Right then I said, Oh Lord, a hunchbacked woman would be a tragedy. Please give me the hunchback so that my wife can be beautiful. Frumtier looked up into his eyes and in that moment something stirred in her heart. She reached out her hand to Moses, which he took, and she later became his devoted wife. In love, there exists a paradox. Two become one, yet remain two. What I've learned from life. I've learned from life. I can't make someone love me. All I can do is strive to be someone who can be loved. I've learned from life. I may be justified in being angry with someone, but that doesn't give me the right to be cruel to them. I've learned from life. No matter how good my friends are, they will hurt me every now and then, and I must forgive them for that. I've learned from life. Before I can forgive others, I have to learn to forgive myself. I've learned from life. Just because someone doesn't love me the way I want them to doesn't mean they don't love me with all they have. I've learned from life. It takes years to build trust with someone, but it can be lost in a moment. I've learned from life. I must always be careful because the mistakes I make in a moment can make me regret it for a lifetime. Fifty-three. The Old Robe This story comes from a time when Zen Buddhism was flourishing, around the 12th and 13th centuries in Japan during the Kamakura period. When Oju left the Japanese lotus sect founded by Nichiren Shonen, his hair had already begun to gray. Turning his back on the snowy peak of Mount Fuji, he crossed several cherry blossom forests heading towards the plains. Carrying only a simple pack and wearing a wide-brimmed hat that covered his face, he walked slowly and steadily like a camel for several days and nights, only stopping briefly to rest. There it is! He looked up and softly exclaimed. A golden bamboo gate and two bushes of purple iris flowers came into view. Beyond the white pebbled path dotted with tiny flowers stood a tall, thin figure leaning on a staff. He knelt down in the manner of a Zen student. Master, he said with an eager voice, expressing a surge of emotion. You're still strong. The tall figure, leaning on the staff, didn't turn around. A silver cloud tinted with the hue of amber drifted over the cedar trees. The morning was warm with rays of sunshine and a gentle rain. Leaving your robe again? Have you come to say goodbye before embarking on a new journey, Oju? The voice of the tall figure was warm and devoid of any emotion. Left my robe? No, master, I haven't left my robe. Never. The figure suddenly turned around, bending slightly to peer at him. Memories flooded back to the old Zen master. The tall figure was none other than Zen Master Dogen, who was 83 years old at the time and there was his chief disciple, Oju Shonen, from thirty years ago. The master vividly remembered the young man with a square jaw, a high forehead, and large blue eyes hidden beneath sharp eyebrows. This student was brilliant but impulsive. During the study sessions, his eyes sparkled with intensity, his voice was eager, and his words flowed like a long river. His reasoning was sharp as a sword. Among 300 students, no one could argue with him on even the smallest point of doctrine. In the meditation hall, 
he was always the first to arrive and the last to leave. His dedication to learning the Dharma and practicing meditation knew no bounds. Yet, Master Dogen always shook his head. Thirty more years, thirty more years. Why? The Master pondered, realizing that Oju struggled to find the ordinary mind. He was never at peace doing mundane tasks like chopping wood, carrying water, watering vegetables, sweeping or weeding. He was a man of great matters, destined for significant tasks. His mission was akin to draining the eastern sea or shouldering the universe in a scythe. Whenever the abbot or the monastery steward assigned him physical work, his face showed his disdain. He would say, Carrying a mountain of books to the Himalayas would be more pleasant than picking up leaves or sweeping. His desire for the truth of the Dharma was fierce and burning. Thus he could not endure the life of an ordinary monk. Therefore he donned the robe of a wandering monk, traveling from high mountains to deep forests. On the morning of their parting, a foggy morning, the old Zen master tenderly gave him an old robe. I have nothing else to give you as a keepsake before you leave. This is the old robe I once gave you, which you discarded, and now I have mended it. Do not forget it. Years passed, and the old Zen master heard that Oju had left the robe again to join another monastery. And again he left, journeying to a valley of yogis somewhere in the far north. One winter day, with snow filling the streams and the wilderness frozen, he crossed twelve mountains and seventeen villages. Late at night, he returned and knocked on the door. The old Zen master welcomed him in his room, lit a stove, warmed some tea, and offered him a packet of herbal candies. What was said between the old teacher and the former student that night, no one knows. The next morning, the tireless wanderer was on his way again, on an uncertain path, still carrying his simple pack. Master, I cannot yet rest. Life and death are destinies that constantly drive me. My knowledge rushes forward like a wild horse, not caring whether it's a cliff or a meadow, my homeland or foreign land. Yet, Master, I still have your old robe, your teachings reminding me whenever I err. It's still here. It's still with me. He smiled distantly, mysteriously, patted his worn pack and bowed his head as he passed through the low door, stepping out into the snow. Twenty years after the cherry blossom season, the old Zen master heard that his student was studying with a Chinese master in the far south of the Ryukyu Islands. Later, he learned under a Korean Zen master in Kochi. And so it went studying under masters from Sri Lanka, Burma, and others. His journey was endless. Whether there was a horizon or not, he would leave again, abandoning the perilous path of logic to immerse himself in the climate of esoteric truths at Toji in southern Kyoto. The ancient fire smoldered and burned, pushing him from the capital to the mountains of northwestern Akita, where he lived on roots and fruits, leading an ascetic life. Leaving the mountains, he returned to Tokyo to preach. His voice roared like a lion before 10,000 attendees, including monks and students from various monasteries and Zen centers. They were stunned, paralyzed by his compelling language and mesmerizing eyes. His first sermon reached the royal court. Leaders of different sects, masters and scholars came under the chairmanship of Prince Cohen, and one by one, he defeated representatives of the Pure Land sect like Shirin Shonen, then Ippin Shonen, a famous wandering monk neither purely Zen nor Pure Land. Successively, he overcame great scholars of the aristocratic Buddhist sects, Tendai, Hoso, Vinaya, Sanron, Kigon, Jodo. He raised the flag of Zen, which he called the Silent Zen. While Prince Cohen wanted to give all glory to the extraordinary master, he had vanished. Nichiren Shonen had died, 1282, and it was hoped that he would become the next patriarch. And now, speak, tell me the rest, 
urged the old master, turning to sit on a white stone stool, his voice gentle, not just repeating scriptures, but what remains, what lingers. Oju looked up, his eyes reflecting the calm waters of the lake. He unpacked his belongings at the feet of his aged master and took out the old robe, its brown hemp faded and frayed, its clumsy patches hanging by threads of gold. He gazed at it deeply, moved. Master, he said, his voice almost lost. This is the old robe from long ago. I wish to wear it again, with your permission. Tears filled the old Zen master's eyes, perhaps the first and last tears he ever shed. Do you have anything else to say, Oju? Your hair is already flecked with dew. Yes. Silence. You have nothing more to say. Yes. Silence again. A red-beaked sparrow chirped, stirring the air. A gentle breeze lifted several cherry blossom petals, tossing them like butterflies. A petal landed on the old robe. The old Zen master smiled, picked it up, and placed it in his palm. Thirty cherry blossom seasons have passed since you left this place. Time flies, but the blossoming and withering of flowers remain the same. He looked up at the sky. The clouds drifting over the cedar trees now sparkled amber. He leaned on his staff and walked slowly away. Watching the frail silhouette of his master, Oju imagined a solitary mountain peak, and he was the long river flowing to the sea. Who would have thought the river would return? The wide monastery courtyard was bustling, hundreds of monks sitting quietly for a moment before their morning porridge. They had finished chanting the Buddha's name, Namu Amida Butsu, followed by contemplation. Their chanting echoed out the large doors, stirring the air still moist with dew. The old Zen master tapped his bamboo stick, and suddenly entered with a middle-aged man, his hair touched with gray. My dear children, the old Zen master patted Oju's shoulder. Today I introduce to you a new monk who has joined our monastery. I have given him the three refugees and the five precepts. His Dharma name is Oju. Live in harmony and respect each other with the six harmonies and the four all-embracing virtues as your guide. Hundreds of curious, interested, or indifferent eyes turned to the older man, older even than some of the senior monks here. But how wild he looked! In a place where physical strength and coarse features were not valued, what was there to learn? Dig the earth. He wore an old, patched, and unattractive robe. Head monk, discipline master, steward monk, teaching monk, where are you? The old Zen master's voice was gentle but firm. At the back of the hall, the four senior monks stood up, folding their hands across their chests. You know your duty towards a new monk. Yes. The old Zen master looked around once more, then slowly walked out the door. His tall shadow, the color of incense smoke, seemed to blend into the mist, leaving only the steady sound of his staff on the pebble path. Come here, come here, fellow seeker. This way, this way. This mat, right here. Your place is at the very end there, youngest brother. New to the monastery, but acting like a master, huh? A hundred waterhalls, haha. <laughs> That's the lowest beginner's lesson. Sweep a thousand baskets of cherry blossom leaves, old man. Wear out countless brooms in countless lifetimes, you'll see. Rough start. Voices followed voices. Sentences overlapped in a noisy mix. A wooden clapper sounded. Brothers, brothers, be quiet. Brothers, brothers, don't forget yourselves. Don't stray. The hall fell silent again. The new monk surprised everyone. He spoke little, as silent as his shadow. He didn't seem to try too hard, but easily completed his assigned tasks. He worked neither slowly nor quickly, sometimes very slowly, sometimes very fast, always with a graceful, light, and serene air, despite his large and heavy body. 
He was never seen in deep thought or meditation, nor daydreaming or sorrowful. Sometimes he would softly hum a few lines of ancient poetry or a verse, the sound barely audible from his throat. Especially, his calm was so profound it chilled others. It was said that the old Zen master allowed him to build a bamboo hut behind the mountain near a man-made stream and a rock garden. One day, a fire broke out in the hut because a monk carelessly lit a fire. By the time they arrived, only ashes remained. The monk was distraught with guilt. Oju just smiled and asked, So, did you get to eat any of the roasted potatoes, or were they all burnt? His robe was set on fire by playful monks while he napped. He woke up to find the back of his robe burned. He suffered severe burns, but did not complain. He didn't know whom to be angry with and always smiled. He smiled at everything. He smiled at all the hazing by the older monks. He smiled at all the dirty, heavy work dumped on him. That's just how it is everywhere. He rarely rested, and when asked why, he said, Right in the midst of work, I always find rest. For him, manual labor and nature were his rest, the most sacred rest, not understood or seen by everyone. Thus, in his work, he was passionate and creative. In nature, he observed the existence of all beings and things with fresh wonder every moment, with his whole heart and soul. Six months later, the teaching monk called him. You handle all tasks well, very well. The steward monk has asked me to start teaching you the basics of the Dharma. But before we begin, I need to understand your level to prepare a suitable Dharma program for you. To do that, you'll need to answer some questions. You became a monk at an older age and came to Buddhism quite late. You know this. So, what do you know about the Buddha? I mean, have you understood what the Buddha is? The new old monk looked awkward, glanced at the learned monk, then lowered his head. Seeing his gaze, the teaching monk tried to explain. You just need to express your idea. No, don't worry about the word idea. It's confusing. The teaching monk frowned. Maybe like this. What image does the word Buddha evoke for you? Yes, an image. A sacred or familiar image you've encountered in life. Yes. Tell me, what is the Buddha? Indeed, Oju was puzzled by this question. What is the Buddha? Where in the dark and obscure language of humans can one find the most accurate expression? Oju's mind worked swiftly, like a bright light scanning through the forest of language. Despite knowing nearly five ancient languages and ten foreign ones, he couldn't find the right word. Words, words lined up in rows like a fast-moving film, and he caught them with the sharp eyes of an owl. But what is the Buddha? Oh! What is the Buddha? So Oju, at a loss, shook his head. You don't know. The teaching monk sighed. If you don't know what the Buddha is, then I'm sorry. Becoming a monk like this is just blind faith. Oh, faith without wisdom is doomed. Oju also sighed. What could he do? It was clear that one couldn't simply say what the Buddha is. To speak of it would ruin it. What is the Dharma? The teaching monk looked at him pityingly and continued, Even if you don't know what the Buddha is, I still hope you understand the Dharma. The truth that led you to renounce worldly life in white lay close for the light of the Dharma. What is the Dharma? I'm trying to find at least a minimal understanding in you, like sifting for gold and sand. What is the Dharma? Dear friend, what is the Dharma? What is the Dharma? Oju suddenly smiled. He knew it in his heart. He had lived and breathed it. But how to express it? Oh, how poor is human language? As he struggled to find the words, he noticed a yellow orchid bud peeking out from behind a brown rock. Look, venerable, he hurriedly pointed. An orchid bud, isn't it? An orchid bud. Oh, how beautiful. What? The teaching monk squinted. What are you saying? You say, look, an orchid bud, a yellow flower, what is it? The teaching monk became angry. 
That's the language of a fake Zen master. Anyone can say a yellow flower so beautiful that's old news. Forget it, novice. The teaching monk stood up abruptly, gathering his books and papers from the table. Go back and report to the steward monk. You won't achieve enlightenment in this life. Only accumulate merit. Strive to accumulate merit through labor, serving the three jewels. This merit will protect and guide you. This path may be slow, but it's steady and firm, suited to your abilities. I pray for the Buddha's blessings for you. As he reached the door, the teaching monk turned back to look at Oju for a long moment. Your hemp robe is too old. Don't you have any parents, relatives, or kin? No, sir. Then I'll suggest to the head monk, the treasury monk, to sew you a few sets of clothes for convenience. That robe is too old. Oju smiled. No need, venerable. This robe is old but more durable than thorns. If one knows how to mend skillfully, it can last a long time. It's just that my hands are clumsy and unskilled. The teaching monk looked at Oju's rough, calloused hands, laughed heartily. Right. You were not born to learn, to sit on the splendid golden seats of masters and scholars. Three loud gongs echoed, breaking the stillness of the night. Torches were suddenly lit everywhere. The master has passed. The news spread quickly. All monks crowded respectfully and silently in front of the old Zen master Dogen's hut. Not a sound was heard. After a while, the whispering chant of the Buddha's name spread and continued to spread. The senior monks and officials knelt in a circle around the Zen platform, hands on their chests, some trying to hold back their tears. The old Zen master Dogen had not been ill or given any warning but had quietly departed. He sat there in the full lotus position, his face radiating peace, but his consciousness had already vanished into a realm of brilliance and light. His earthly journey was complete, but what about his successor? Had he passed on the teachings to anyone? That was the question haunting everyone's mind. No will or final teaching was found. It was a difficult situation. The head monk had lived a life of joy and renunciation, the senior monk in years and virtue. The steward monk had devoted his life to service, high in virtue and with countless merits. The disciplined monk, though older and more respected, was a model of strictness and purity. The teaching monk, though slightly younger and less experienced, had spent a life of little sleep and little food, diligently teaching hundreds of classes and dozens of levels. Moreover, he was thoroughly versed in the Tripitaka, the soul of knowledge and wisdom for the monastery. Three days after the cremation ceremony, a restricted meeting was held, attended only by monks of a certain rank or higher. Four groups of friends, disciples or sympathizers of the four senior monks argued for their factions. Each could present valid and specific evidence. At first, the language was modest and polite. As no one conceded, the discussion turned into an argument, then heated, loud, and tumultuous. Some arms were raised in anger. Some eyes were glaring fiercely. The sound of wooden clappers was incessant. Brothers, brothers, be quiet. Brothers, brothers, don't be reckless. Remember yourselves. But it was useless. There were too many young and restless horses and chickens here. While the debate raged in the meditation hall, a shadow quietly slipped through the trees to the new pagoda behind the mountain. The shadow knelt from the first watch until the star Venus rose. He stood, shaking the dew from his robe and lit three sticks of incense. The fog filled the sky. The wind was cold and biting. Turning towards the old path, he paused at the golden bamboo gate and purple irises, the pale moonlight barely piercing the thick fog. A lone owl hooted. He looked around, then shouldered his worldly burden and followed the pebble path disappearing at the foot of the hill. That was Oju, silently leaving the monastery, gently and more solitary than one who renounces life itself. 
He went to a cave, solemnly donned the old robe, and calmly entered Nirvana, a smile of immortality on his lips. Through the dim light from the cave entrance, one could read on the back of the old robe in unmistakable handwriting, simple and sincere, the final teaching of the late Zen master. Depend on the Dharma, not on the person. Depend on the person, not on the Dharma. When person and Dharma are both understood, seek not, nor grasp. Thus, the Dharma and the person were extinguished together in the cave. Therefore, this sect no longer exists. It is said that 180 years later, these relics were still there. An unnamed Zen artist wandering through the mountains and rivers came upon this place, moved by the story of the ancients, composed a poem in majestic script that seems to last through the ages on the cave wall. The master is the solitary mountain peak, silent for eons. The disciple is the long river, rushing from the mountain to the sea. Here remains the old robe, with a sigh. Here remain the mountains and seas with a serene smile. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So, let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom.